And this is really a special treat uh, for a lot of us who follow the animal and birding world. And uh, it's, uh, I want to thank uh, Jack for suggesting uh, Kindred Kingdoms and uh, Gene and Len Soprano, who are certified rehabilita wildlife rehabilitation specialists. Uh, they handle both birds of prey and animals. Uh, right now they're concentrating on birds of prey and bear cubs. And they'll tell you a little bit about uh, each. No, there are no bear cubs in there. <laughs> Even though I think probably when they get them, they probably can fit in here in a little basket there. Uh, they're so tiny. But it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce them and to have them come on up and tell you a little bit about their rehab experiences. Uh, they've got a slideshow, and then Gene will bring out uh, the owls and the hawks that are in these uh, crates. So, Gene? First of all, I want to thank you for this invitation. It's just a beautiful, beautiful day to be out in Skinny Owls, New York. Um, to begin with, I would like to just tell you a little story. We received a phone call from a um, forest ranger who was up in Camden, New York, a little town north of us. We live in Oswego County. And uh, Camden is, uh, oh, maybe a half hour, 40 minutes north. And someone had been out walking in a wooded area and came across a huge adult female bald eagle who was on the ground, wobbling, falling over, picking herself up, trying to balance with her wings and falling over, and that is absolutely not normal eagle behavior. So we knew there was something wrong, and being the top of the food chain, uh, we often find that eagles uh, will succumb to lead poisoning. And so, after receiving this big female and uh, being fortunate enough to have wonderful, wonderful veterinarian seven and a half miles from our home, uh, the eagle was able to be treated and yes, it uh, tested positive for a considerable amount of lead and we were able to get it on an antidote right away and uh, pretty soon she just got stronger and stronger and she could sit up on her own. We no longer had to hand feed her. She was taking little tiny bits of fish, you know, from tweezers and uh, each day she got better. Finally, the day came when uh, she was out in our 176 foot flight cage, flying back and forth, totally recovered, and we knew it was time for her to go back to her family. We have a good friend who is a uh, biologist with the New York State DEC, and she does all the eagle banding in this area, and this eagle had not been banded. So Bonnie came out, and we put a little hood on the eagle and put her uh, on her back on a, a big table, and here she is, I can guess he's around, here she is getting her U.S. Fish and Wildlife band on. And that's a silver band. And then on the other leg, she was given her New York State DEC band. So here's her big foot, and her number is Z37. If you ever meet her, say hello to her for us. And here is her release back to the wild. So when I had her on her back, I took a tape measure and I measured her wingspan from her heel out to her, uh, for her last primary feather and it was just 39 inches. So of course she has another side, so her total wingspan was 78 inches. And I measured her from her top to her bottom and she was just exactly three feet. So one of my little volunteers is a little artist and she does a lot of uh, airbrush work and I said to her, Kayla, I need for you to make me an eagle that has a 78 inch wingspan and is just three feet top to bottom. So here she is. up in the sky they don't look that big but when they're in your hand this 
is the size of a female bald eagle. In 1972, there was one known eagle's nest left in the state of New York, and that was south of Rochester in the Genesee River Valley. In 2011, we rehabilitated two juvenile eagles that came to us from Rockland County. The whole nest had been a huge storm, the whole nest had fallen down, and uh, anyway, they came out of nest number 221. So we now know there's over 300 eagles nests, and I'm sure there are more that the DPC doesn't even know about or we haven't counted yet, but they are certainly making a huge comeback, and you folks living here on Skinny Atlas Lake are probably seeing them. You know, there were years and years you didn't see any, and now they're becoming more common. They're making a wonderful comeback. So with that, let's get started. There's one thing, and only one thing, that um, is common to all birds. And when I go to schools, I always say to the kids, does anybody know what birds have that nothing else has? And most of the kids say beaks. Well, that's 99.9% .9 right. But turtles have beaks as well. And a lot of kids say they fly. Well, so do bats and they're not birds. And one little smart boy said they have hollow bones. 99.9% .9 right. The penguin does not have hollow bones. But of course, the one thing that is unique to birds only is feathers. And this is an example of a big uh, turkey vulture feather and a great horned owl feather. And I like to show these to kids because birds do something called preening, which is, you know, they clean their feathers. Their feathers have to be in perfect condition for flight. And they do this all the time with their beaks. They pull them apart. And then they take their beak and carefully put them back together, and they just kind of zip back up like Velcro. So, birds have, they have a variety of different kinds of feathers, and each of their feathers has a different function. For example, these little down feathers are what I consider their underwear because that's the layer that touches their skin. And there's tens of thousands of little down feathers. And they, of course, are used for insulation. The next layer are these little semi-plumes. I consider those their jeans and sweatshirt feathers. It's the next layer over that. And they also are going to be used for insulation. And then they have their contour feathers, sometimes called their primaries and uh, sometimes called their flight feathers. And if you see any patterning or color, those are the feathers that would have patterns and colors. This little feather is very strange. It's called the phyloplume. It has a long shaft with a tuft on top. And I like to think of them as the bird's sense of touch. They sandwich in between all the other feathers. And if those feathers are out of place, that tells the bird that it's time to preen. The last feathers over here, they're little bristles. Sometimes they're called rectal bristles. Those feathers are very prominent on their face. You see them uh, mostly in owls, but, but the, it looks like kind of a little mustache. And they act like cat whiskers. So if there's anything on the owl, uh, anything on the bird's face, um, those little uh, whiskers are going to give them a sensation of what is around their face. If you looked at a feather underneath a microscope, you'd see that it looks very much like a tree. The main trunk is over here is the shaft, and then they have all these little barbs that come out as branches and barbules, and you'll notice these little hooks. So when I just took that feather apart and zipped it back together, it really is like Velcro, because I undid the little hooks and then I zipped them back together so that they would, um, they would bond. I know that looks like a drawing, but it's actually a photograph. And it's a photograph of a fossilized feather that was found in a limestone quarry in Leipzig, Germany in the 1880s. Now we know that that limestone quarry has several different layers, and the whole quarry dated back 150 million years. So we don't know exactly the age of that feather, but we know that it was very old. We also know 
that paleontologists have located owl skeletons, that they've been able to date 50 million years, and they've hardly changed at all in 50 million years. So here's a really good example of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So um, hawk feathers and owl feathers are very, very different. Um, on the left, you'll see a hawk feather. It's very smooth and streamlined on the side uh, versus the owl feather that's fringed. The hawk is going to fly faster than the owl, and they're going to catch their prey by speed, whereas the owl is going to catch their prey by ambush. They will fly slower, but the little fringes will pull up the air and allow the owl to fly totally silently. You'll notice that their feathers are uh, arranged very much like the shingles on a roof. This is an osprey, sometimes called a fish hawk. And I can tell that it is an adult because it has bright yellow eyes. And on their wings, they have primary feathers, secondary feathers, and little feathers that cover that called coverts. And notice this little screech owl. By the way, this little guy came from not too far around here, near the Auburn area. He was released this year. It's a little uh, red-faced screech owl. But just before his release, I said, I really need a picture of your wing because I wanted to show you how one the patterning is. The, um, the stripes are consistent from one feather to, to the other to make the bird look so camouflaged. Hawks are diurnal animals, that means they hunt by the day, and owls are <coughs> nocturnal animals, they hunt at night, so one is the day shift, one is the night shift. You can always tell an owl because they have this big ice cream cone kind of shaped tail. And their talons are very different. Here's an example of uh, the talons of a red-tailed hawk. Three in the front, one in the back, and notice the one in the back, and it, it looks very rounded out here, but flat. They have very uh, flat underneath. One exception to that rule is, again, the osprey. These guys are fish eaters, so their talons are fish hooks. And, well, you wouldn't want those digging into you at all. They're very fierce. They're not rounded. Owls, on the other hand, are going to have feathers that go all the way to their feet. And they have two toes in the front, two toes in the back. So if an owl is standing in a correct position, you're only going to see the two toes. And by the way, I have seen so many artists get that wrong. Next time you see a painted owl, how, how many toes? They're usually going to see they have three toes in the front. But if they're standing, you don't see those toes. You just see the three, or the two. Um, however, they do have a strange little knuckle that they can, if they want to, bring this toe around. By the way, that is the bottom of a snowy owl foot. Uh, but when they're hunting, they'll always have two toes in the back and two in the front, their back toes are their grasping toes, and their front toes are their killing toes. You and I have eyes uh, positioned on either side of our nose, and so does an owl. A hawk, on the other hand, has eyes way back here. So humans and hawks can only turn their head 180 degrees, but a hawk the position of his eyes can actually see farther behind him. Owls have one bone that's going to connect the head to the shoulders, and it acts as a ball bearing, which allows them to turn their head 270 degrees. Sometimes, however, it looks like the owl really has his head on backwards. You can see how this little great horn, his, uh, his eyes are positioned right in front. And notice the flatness of that beak because they're not only going to be hunting by sight, but by sound. And they don't want anything to interrupt the sound to go back into those ears, including the beak. So sound has to be able to have a clear line to their ear area. 
Hawks, on the other hand, have a much more kind of a Roman nose look to them, smaller eyes and eyes much further back. Here's a, a great horned owl skull, and you can see that they, uh, where the eye sockets are, they have a cylindrical bone. So um, owls do not have any muscles to move their eyes around in their head. In other words, I can stand here, I can be, my nose can be facing that back wall, but if I want to look up, I can just turn my eyes up or turn my eyes around and look to the right or left. Owls cannot do that. So if they want to look up, they have to put their whole head up and move their head uh, to accommodate where they want to look. On the other hand, Look at how far back the, uh, in the uh, skull of the hawk, how far back the eyes are. The hawk eye, remember they're diurnal, so the lens is going to be considerably smaller. The distance from the lens to the retina, which is the screen the image will be shown on, is quite a bit larger. And look at the comparison to the owl eye huge lens, probably the largest lens of any animal because, again, they're nocturnal and they can see as well during the nighttime hours as during the daytime hours. Lots of light can get through that lens. Birds also have something called a third eyelid or a nictitating membrane. So you can see this little eyelid here. They have eyelids just like us, you know, top and bottom, but the third eyelid has a couple of functions. Number one, they act as um, windshield wipers if they are flying through rain, sleet, snow, fog, hail. Uh, they can blink that little uh, nictitating membrane and it's going to protect the eye and lubricate it. And also, that nictitating uh, membrane is going to act as safety goggles because when they grab that little mouse, they're not going to let go and they're not going to bring it to their mouth while it's still moving. They don't want anything around their face, it's still alive. And so they're going to just hold on till all movement stopped. But on the bottoms of their feet, in that bottom layer, they have something called Herbst corpuscles. And that is directly connected to that eyelid so that the second they grab that mouse, bam, that the eyelid closes. And that becomes their little safety goggles. I was just lucky enough to get a picture of that little uh, juvenile Cooper's Hawks, who, by the way, had bright uh, blue eyes. We call baby Cooper's Hawks little Frank Sinatras. And um, I was just lucky enough to get that picture when he was blinking his uh, nictitating membranes. Looks like he's got little blue marbles in his head. If an owl is born with brown eyes, they will maintain that color throughout their life. If an owl was born with yellow eyes, they will maintain that color. On the other hand, hawks are born with very, very light colored eyes. This is a, a red tailed hawk. I can tell it's a juvenile, not only because it doesn't have its red tail yet, but because the eyes are kind of sandy, beige color, and each year they get darker and darker and darker. So a really well-seasoned red tail is going to have eyes that are so brown they're almost black. I can tell by looking at the eyes of that bird that it's at least five to seven years old. And we blink down. When you go to sleep at night, your top eyelid comes down when you close your eyes. Birds blink up. This is a little Merlin who I just was able to catch that as he was blinking. Now, birds are really unique in that they get to see things that we don't. In other words, if you're standing, looking out at a field, all you're going to see is grass. Now, you might hear insects, you might hear a little mouse scurrying through that field, but you're not going to be able to get a visual on it. Little merlins and kestrels, they can all see something that we can't, which is ultraviolet light. And therefore, that little mouse that's in that field is going to be scurrying along, and as he goes, he's going to lead a, a, lead a little trail of urine 
And this is how the mouse is going to communicate with his other mouse friends, and they can find each other that way. But since birds can see uh, ultraviolet, that's what they see. So all they have to do to find that little mouse is connect the dots. So here that little mouse was over here, and he's following, and now it stops over here. So that Merlin knows exactly where to pounce. Owls have something called um, irregular ears. So this is a skull of a great horned owl, and you can see over here is a big uh, ear hole that's kind of small, and here, this, take, this is the other side, so they're offset. Your ears and mine are symmetrical and match each other, but owls do not. So when they're hunting, they're going to do something called triangulation. You'll hear the word triangle in that word. So they're going to go with their head up, over, down, up, over, down. And sometimes they do it so fast it looks like they're just doing this. And probably you'll see that in one of the little birds that I'll bring out in a little while. If you took a cross section of the top of an owl head and looked down, you'd see huge amounts of the skull are taken up by the eyes, these gigantic eyes. Huge amounts of the skull are taken up by their ears, all this apparatus is for hearing. So back here, we have not a whole lot of space left over for a great big brain. So even though you've always heard that owls are very wise, not so much. <laughs> this is an actual photograph of an owl's ear. I had a little barn owl this, uh, this summer that we rehabilitated, and just prior to releasing him, um, I said, just let me get one little picture of your ear. So I parted the feathers, one of my little volunteers helped him, I parted the feathers, and you can see this, all this huge flap of skin. And all this is all membranes that takes the sound right down into this cavity to uh, the eardrum and beyond. But what I thought is so unique about their hearing is over here is a muscle. And all these little feathers line up like trees on the side of that muscle. So when an owl is sitting in a tree and his beak is heading this way, and he doesn't want to make any movement to turn around, but he hears something behind him, he moves that muscle and those little feathers, and they can turn, and he can hear just as well everything going on behind him as in front of him. Imagine. Both hawks and owls cast pellets. Um, hawk pellets tend to be more felt-like. They're more compact, they're a little harder. Owl pellets, you can actually uh, take apart. They're quite easy to take apart. And if you ever find one in the woods, you can take it apart and see exactly what the last meal was. Uh, because here, I took this owl pellet apart, and here's a jawbone with a tooth attached to it, and all kinds of little rib bones, and leg bones, and arm bones. And uh, so they cast the pellet because their body is not going to need everything they eat. In other words, they're going to eat that mouse whole, but their body's not going to digest the teeth. They can extract the calcium uh, that they need and uh, get from the bones, and uh, they're not going to need, if they ate a bird, they're not going to need the feathers. So they just spit it out. And they do that at least once a day. Here's a little Cooper's hawk, and doesn't it look like he just swallowed a tennis ball? Hawks have a great big crop. Owls do not have a crop. And um, what that is, it's an enlargement of the esophagus. Because you know, they're not going to be successful hunters every day. Let's say this little Cooper's hawk was lucky enough to catch a pigeon on Monday. He will gorge himself. He will fill his stomach. He will fill his crop. And as, as his stomach empties, the food from the crop is going to dissipate and go down into the stomach. And um, he might, the next day, he might not catch anything. And maybe he doesn't catch anything on Wednesday either. So this is his own individual doggy bag, his to-go bag. This is where he can store leftovers. It doesn't matter if we're talking about hawks, owls, eagles, falcons, exhibitors, vultures, they all pop out of the egg as little white fuzzballs. 
These are little baby uh, screech owls, a little baby kestrel, great horned owl. But they can't stay little very long because from egg to migration, if, we're, if it's a migratory bird, they gotta be on the road by late August. So if they come out of the egg in March, by August, September, they have to have their full adult plumage. This is a little uh, northern harrier, and you can see she's just going through the transition of changing her natal down into her adult plumage. She still has all the natal down on her head and her wings. And the little kestrels are just, you can just see little specks of natal down left on their heads. And pretty soon, the little screech owls have to look more and more like their parents. Their, their coloration changes, they get darker, they begin to get the little tufts on the tops of their head. And one thing that we have noticed about both hawks and owls in rehabilitating them is they make wonderful foster parents. So this little barred owl baby, looks like he's got his aviator glasses on, he came to us uh, weak and thin and dehydrated and very malnourished. And um, she came to us as an adult with a badly broken wing. And so uh, we would much prefer that owls raise owls rather than humans raise owls. So we can put the baby with the adult parent and watch them to make sure that everything is going gonna, is gonna to be fine. And pretty soon she will help to feed the baby at night. She'll put the baby right underneath her wing. And the same thing with this little uh, gray horn and that baby. Um, by the way, the last picture, the baby eventually got released. The adult had a badly broken wing, could not be released back to the wild. So she has lived now for several years at the Utica Zoo. Her name is Gracie. And if you ever get to the zoo, you'll probably be able to see her. One exception to the plumage rule is bald eagles. I took this picture in the month of August. That baby was in an egg in March, and they have to grow very quickly. By the time they leave the nest, they pretty much have their adult size. However, they're not going to get their adult plumage for a full five years. So in this picture, you can see that this juvenile has got a black uh, beak, black, uh, very dark brown eyes, no white head, no white tail, but f in five years, that's what he will look like. Um, the beak changes from dark brown to school bus yellow. The eyes change to yellow and they get their white tail and white head plumage. Sometimes the juveniles are darker than the parents. This is a little juvenile sawwet owl. They just, they're just the color of German chocolate cake. And this is the adult. And sometimes the females look radically different from the males. This is a female northern harrier, and that's the male. On a bad attitude day. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little uh, screech owl that happens to be a gray phase, but sometimes they come to us as a red phase. They're just the color of a new minted copper penny. But it doesn't matter what species we're talking about. In the bird prey world, the females are always at least a third larger than the males. So you can see the male great horn versus the female. Look at the size of her. Because you know, she's going to have to incubate those eggs for 28 days and not move. And she needs that extra fat reserve. Whereas he's the hunter. And he's going to have to have a smaller, lighter body to get in and out of trees, to fly over fields, to grab a rabbit or a squirrel to bring back to her. Ospreys, whole different breed of cat. Ospreys are found on every continent in the world except Antarctica. And as I said, they are a fish eater and have this wonderful adaptation for that. If you can see this little nostril, right, these nostrils right here, they have huge nostrils. And if you feel them, they feel very much like soft rubber inner tubes because as they dive underwater, those nostril flaps become their own um, nose plugs. And they close them up 
go underwater to grab a fish. Oh, by the way, that is a picture of a juvenile with the orange eyes. And they grab a fish with these spiky feet. And by the way, look, doesn't, don't these look like thorns on a rose bush? And if you feel them, they actually are very sharp. It's just like a football player or a golfer has spikes on the bottoms of their feet for grasping. Um, so do ospreys. The fish are moving, they're slimy, they are you know, wiggly, and so in order to be, uh, assert themselves and grab a fish, they're going to have uh, the, those feet dig right into the fish. Once they grab the fish underwater, the fish is horizontal. When they come up out of the water, they don't want to have it horizontal because it's going to impede flight. So they drop the fish with one foot, reposition it so that the head of the fish and the head of the bird are going the same way. Then they'll fly up to a branch. And ospreys eat very differently than owls and hawks. They're not going to gorge themselves with, with, on big bites. They twist the flesh and they take little tiny delicate bites. And I can tell by the position of those feet that that osprey has got a fish and doesn't even care that uh, it's pretty ferocious looking waves there. Like eagles, they continue to add to their nests every year. Some of their nests can weigh hundreds of pounds and uh, they pick up huge branches. Some hawks and eagles too have this wonderful little ridge right here over the eye. It's called the supraorbital ridge. And they use it as a baseball cap visor because it blocks the sun. Owls have a huge dish face for collecting sound. Kestrels, merlins, peregrines, they all have these beautiful little black lines underneath their eyes, just like Football players have eye grease. They're used to block the glare of the sun. This is probably my very, very favorite adaptation, and it's only seen in one species, and that's the barn owl, uh, B-A-R-N, not B-A-R-N. And this adaptation, you can see this middle toe, and it's only on the middle toe. You can see these little lines. They look like slits, like somebody took a bread knife and made a little slit and they have their own built-in comb. And they take their little foot go, <laughs> and comb around their own, uh, their own neck. Peregrine falcons, uh, they are a bird-eating bird. And they're going to fly over a, a, a whole uh, flock of maybe pigeons or ducks, and they will just come right out of the sky and grab that bird, and they have their own little tooth. This right here is called a tomial tooth, and you can see how the upper mandible and the lower mandible fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And they are going to crack with that tooth the neck of the bird that they catch, just like if you went to Red Lobster, you would have little crab crackers and to, to do the same thing. I put this picture in here because I like to show how science changes. As we gain new knowledge and new information, ornithologists will um, change um, the nomenclature of different species. Now, for many, many years, vultures used to be considered birds of prey. But, um, you know, they took a closer look at their feet and their beak, and uh, they really were like a bird of prey. So they have recently reclassified vultures, and vultures are now in the family of storks. Now there's a face only a mother could love. It's a, a, a baby vulture I'm feeding with tweezers, and you can see right through their nostrils. Their nostrils are like a hole. He's just as well as a little baby fuzz and he's leaving. Well, anyway, um, the best part of wildlife rehabilitation is to see them go. We love to see them come, but we really love to see them be returned back to the wild. 
Um, this is one of the little juvenile bald eagles that we raised in 2011. It was released on October 17, 2011. A brother and sister pair, and they were banded number W48 and W49. And this winter, we were fortunate enough to get an email from uh, the New York State DEC that someone had spotted W48 behind Destiny Mall in Syracuse. And here it is, 2015. So we know she's out there making a good living for herself. There they go. Oh, a little owl that we took back to Howland Island. This guy came to us with avian malaria. Uh, so we caught it in time and he, he made a wonderful recovery with the proper medications. And I'm sure his mate was saying, where on earth have you been? <laughs> and they don't even say goodbye. They're so grateful to be back where they belong. Back in the sky, a whole kettle and taken off. So with that, I will stop and introduce you to some of my little friends I brought over. Phase. You know, we live up in Oswego County, and many of the screech owls that we get kind of have their own coloration. Uh, the screech owls that we get from the Tompkins County, anybody? Tompkins County, uh, Ithaca area, are very smoky gray. Oh, she's going to bite. But you know what? I'm glad she's putting her head down, because I'll come around. Can you see fine little stripes on the top of her head? These little Screech owls would be eaten by a great horned owl if a great horned or a barred owl flew over them. So they line themselves up underneath branches of trees so that if another larger owl flies over them, the shadow of the branches line up with these stripes. So it just kind of looks two-dimensional from another owl from above, and that is another way that they can protect themselves. So, she is a She's not, no. She's fully That's grown. How That's how big they get, yes. Yeah. And of course they're called screech owls because they do screech. They have a variety of different sounds. But uh, if you hear them out at night, you'll you'll identify a little screech owl. She looks like she likes to be pet. Oh yeah, yeah, she's a um, she was hit by a car, this is why she stays with us, and had some head trauma, and as a result has cataracts, and doesn't see, doesn't see as well as she would need to, to be released back to the wild. But um, people always say, I never see these birds in the wild. You gotta get up at 2 a.m. <laughs> 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 that's, that's when you're gonna see these little ones. And you can see, these are just her little feathers to make her look big and fierce. But these black lines, if I parted those black lines, her ears are down inside those black lines, inside those little feathers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And look at how broad his tail is. Oh, wow. Wow. Black and white striped bird. And I love these little hawks. They're a considerably smaller hawk than the red tails, or um, any uh, of the other hawks. Um, Anyway, they are a true migrator. Here, why don't I just take you like this? We'll just take you like this. This is good. They are a true migrator, which means they have two summers and no winters. They leave upstate New York um, sometime around late August, early September. They fly all the way down the eastern seaboard. They fly uh, across uh, the islands in the Caribbean. They'll hopscotch those islands, they'll rest there and uh, feed and then go on. Sometimes if they're flying out over the ocean, they're not going to find any thermals or updrafts over water. So they become tired and uh, they've been known to land on the decks of big ships just to rest and go on. They've also been known to, a lot of them will land on oil derricks that are out in the um, Gulf of Mexico. They will go down to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Some of them will go into Central America and South America, and they just get there and turn around and come back. And we see them flying over Derby Hill, which is uh, on the flyway up near Mexico, New York, not far from us. And in the month of May, 
by late April, early May, they count over 25,000 broadwings flying over uh, Derby Hill. And you know, they skirt Lake Ontario because, uh, again, they're not going to find thermals there. It's much easier if they can find a thermal to glide on. And that's, you know, that it's, uh, that's not powered flight. But they're just a delightful little bird. This little guy was hit by a car. And uh, even though his wings look very symmetrical, he had wing damage and we couldn't certainly ask him to fly several thousand miles in migration. So this is why he stays with us, the little broad wing hawk. and they use their own pellets as a nest. They'll collect their own owl pellets and they kind of stamp them down so they're like felt. And they put them in a circle and then they will put the, lay their eggs in, uh, in that nest. Now, in the state of Connecticut has just put barn owls on their endangered species list because there really aren't many there. And we don't have many here in upstate New York. I do have a friend down in the Catskills that rehabilitated two or three of them last year. So they are available in the wild, but nationally, a lot of them live in the South, and there are men, they're very prevalent because they do not just have one clutch a year, they usually have two. So they can lay four to six eggs the first time in you know April or March, and then again maybe in August. So watch this head. You can maybe see this movement. Mm. They hunt just as much by sound. Wow. See how, see how he's doing this little rocking thing? Yeah. That's his triangulation. And I can tell he's a little male because his chest is very, very white. The females, not only are they larger, but their chest is that same cinnamon color as his wings on the top of his head. Um, these guys have a lot of different names. Sometimes in some parts of the country, they're called monkey-faced owls, heart-shaped owls. Uh, sometimes they're called steeple owls because they will also roost in the steeples of churches. And they have quite a loud scream. Their ancestors came from the European continent, whereas most of the other birds did not. They uh, are Asi Asiatic. My husband calls him our Christmas cookie sprinkle boy. <laughs> I didn't know they had those markings. They have, I look at the markings, I know, aren't they beautiful? They're just, they're so camouflaged. If you put them next to a piece of wood, you just wouldn't even see them. And you can also see how fringe those little wings are. A peregrine. And you can see she has wing damage to her right wing. And she came to us on Christmas Eve, December 24th, two years ago. We received a phone call from a gentleman who lives out near Auburn, south of Auburn. He was a off-duty Auburn police officer and came home and it, there was a lot of snow and he saw quite a bit of blood in the snow and uh, followed it to her. Now, even though peregrine falcons have been taken off the endangered species list nationally, here in the state of New York they are still on the endangered species list. But that being said, uh, we immediately got her down to Cornell University to be treated and the x-ray showed that she had been shot. Um, had the perpetrator been caught, there would have been a jail sentence, um, thousands of dollars of fines, but of course, there was we were not able to get a conviction. She's had three operations at Cornell on that wing, obviously could not uh, be returned back to the wild, so this is why she stays with us. And I just worked and worked with her, and we go for walks in the park and walks in the woods so that she can just kind of get used to us. This bird is the fastest bird on the earth. <laughs> yeah. um, they will fly over a flock of ducks, pigeons, and take a look at her toes. Very, very long toes. 
toes. They will look below them and see a meal, and they ball up their toes into a fist, a tight, tight fist, and they dive into what's called a stoop. And some peregrines have actually been clocked at, at going into a stoop over 200 miles an hour. Now the cheetah is the fastest land animal. They can run at 80 miles an hour, but overall the peregrine in that stoop is by far faster. And they literally punch that bird right out of the sky and follow it to the ground. And that's how they catch a meal. So they're a pretty ferocious hunter. I don't know why. I have never read this in a book. We have, we have rehabilitated several peregrines, and I hope someday some ornithologist tells me why this is true. They have a very distinct smell. And it's not a bad smell. It smells like fall burning leaves. And I can, sm I can smell her right now, and it's only in peregrines. We don't get that smell from any other bird. So anybody can find out what that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see she's kind of a dark peregrine. A lot of the other ones that we've got are lighter. How the peregrines in, Sy in Syracuse have now had their babies, and they're being uh, banded, I think, this coming week. Yeah. How do you feed her? Um, well, they're a bird-eating bird, and so um, there is a company in um, Vermont called Cavendish Game Farms, and so I order her on ice um, quail, feathers and all, so that's what she gets. So um, she never misses a meal. She's <laughs> ferocious eater. She loves breakfast. And Look at the size of her little eyes. This is our snowy owl, and you can see too that he has had an injury to his right wing, hit by a car in the Utica area. He's been in captivity for several years, but boy, you can see those ripped old bristles. Mm. Look at the, his uh, little uh, feathers around his face. They are born so far above the Arctic Circle that their whole body is just totally covered in feathers. Um, you can see his feet, feathers all the way down to the bottoms of his feet, and really pretty much all you can see that's not feathered are his eyes. Even his little nares on his beak are feathered. Um, they are not a tree-dwelling bird, because where they're found on the top of there aren't any trees. So they uh, actually take little stone rocks and make a, a little mound right on the ground, a very shallow mound, and lay their eggs on the ground. When they lie down to sleep, they like a poodle or like a copper spaniel will put their little legs way out behind them, they almost look dead. But um, we can tell he's a male because he's very, very white. He has the little speckles on his wings. However, the female and the juveniles have speckles all over their body. He, is, he has very few on his head, very few on his chest. So this is how we know he is a male. Um, both the parents take care of the juveniles. And heaven help the arctic fox who goes near that nest. Like killdeer, you've probably seen little killdeer, they will pretend they have a broken wing to get something away from the nest and always do the same thing. So they'll kind of limp along and, and dissuade uh, any predator to, uh, to get away from the nest. And now is our great horned owl, male. And uh, you see this little white thing, this like, flapping, that little white thing? Well, like dogs, Owls do not have sweat glands. So uh, if your dog gets a little warm in the summertime, okay, thank you. I'm going to get the back of my face. <laughs> still winter for us. 
they uh, are going to be the first to lay eggs. And that little white patch helps them find a mate. So if there's a teenage male and a teenage female that have not mated yet, uh, once they do choose a mate, they mate for life. But this is how they identify each other and find each other. So they'll be on opposite ends of the forest, fluttering this little white patch back and forth. And they'll also be hooting, you know, communicating vocally. And pretty soon she will fly closer and closer to him. And then she'll land in the tree he's in. And she will signal to him, I'm not sure if I'm going to choose you as a mate yet or not, but you better show me that you're going to be a good provider. So he'll fly off and maybe he'll bring her back a little mouse or a vole or a mole, and she'll accept it with one gulp. It's nothing more than a little M&M &M to her. And um, she will probably, if she's smart, communicate to him, is that as good as it gets? Look, man, if he's smart, he will fly off and get her a whole adult squirrel or an adult rabbit. Because if she chooses him as a mate, he's going to have to provide for himself, provide for her, and provide for at least two or three other little owls. So he can be responsible for feeding five owls, and that's a huge job on his part. So uh, that is one of the ways that little white patch is used. Look at how camouflaged he is. If you saw him sitting in a tree, he just looks like bark. Just totally, uh, completely camouflaged. Can you, walk, can you walk her around the back? Yeah, look okay. Back. Look at the size of his eyes in comparison to the size of his face. If your eyes and mine were the same eyes and size as his, in comparison to the size of your face, our eyes would have to be at least the size of navel oranges. So you can see how much of those even though I showed you how much of the skull takes off. Uh, these again are not in his ears, his ears are behind those black things. And uh, he stays with us because I'm going to assume that maybe he tried to catch a squirrel and he didn't have a good grip, and the squirrel bit off one back toe and he has nerve damage to the other back toe, and they need all their toes for hunting. So, since he didn't have all his toes for hunting, he was out on Route 11 in Lakeport eating rodeo. And then he got hit by a pickup truck. And so the guy who hit him felt terrible, got him up in the truck, and called the local dog catcher, who called our veterinarian, and that's how we got Isaac. And he's been with us for about 17 years. Wow. And would you show our in your beautiful wings? And believe it or not, they're pretty prevalent. You know, a great horned owl used to really be just deep forest birds. But um, when mankind left the farms and went into the suburbs to work in factories in the cities, these guys figured out wherever there's people, there's garbage. And wherever there's garbage, there's rodents. And so they just followed the food. And the calls that we get on injured great horned owls, 90% of them or more, the reason they come into uh, rehabilitation is vehicular damage. They're hit by cars. And that's because of their hunting habits. They'll be up in a tree, they'll see something, they'll fly down, and they cross right at, um, just above the ground. They'll be stalking something. And that takes them right across highways because they really don't understand our highway system. <laughs> Neither we do. <laughs>
they somehow get along with each other, or do you have to keep them all separate? Uh, we keep them totally separate. Totally separate, yes. And as a matter of fact, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you can take a virtual tour of our facility by just going on kindredkingdoms.com and push on the virtual tour, and then you'll see some of the bear cubs and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> tell us a little, get, just tell us a, just a couple, because we were almost wrapping up, but uh, a little bit about the, Is this the bear on or off? Uh, well, we've been rehabilitating a total of, I think, 26 years, but about um, 18, 19 years ago, we started rehabilitating black bear cubs. And collectively, uh, we received a one little cub last week, and he, a little male, was cub number 108. So we had, uh, we lived with bears for a long time. Um, and right now we have six bears with us. Four of them are yearlings, and they will be released back to the wild next month in June. And the two babies will stay with us until they are old enough and grown enough to, you know, support themselves in the wild. I have a question. When you put it back into the wild, is their relationship with humans make them more, more at risk? No, and I'll tell you why. We take, we go to great, great lengths to prevent that from happening. Um, for example, when the cubs come in, you know, a, a bear cub is under one pound at birth. They, all, they weigh between 11 and 14 grams of, uh, ounces at birth. And they look like little black cucumbers, just the size of a cucumber with little claws. And, uh, but they grow rapidly and we wean them from a bottle as quickly as possible. The minute we see tongue lapping, they don't get the bottle anymore. Then they have to drink from a bowl. And we gradually add more solid food. Gerbers, oh, Gerber, we love Gerbers. Gerbers, you know, baby foods and little whole grain Cheerios and little applesauce, and then constantly uh, get, their, get them on more solid foods. The second they are lapping, they don't see much of us at all. They go to big outdoor habitats, and, and you'll see this on our virtual tour. They, our, our bear habitats are way back in our woods. We monitor them by closed circuit TV. We have cameras, cameras all over. And so we can watch them without them watching us. And we have a system whereby um, there are little guillotine doors. We can open the door, pull out a huge pig trough on wheels, on, on little, like little wheels, and so we can clean the trough and restock it with food and push it back in. So even to feed them, we don't have to invade their space. And they have each other. And you know, we provide them with all kinds of climbing things and things that they would find naturally in the wild. They love pumpkins in the fall. We just throw in pumpkins and they rip them apart and logs, because you know, they're, they're gonna have to be log rollers. They go under logs and take out worms and grubs and things like that, so they learn to forage. And um, then in the fall, the DEC comes and gets them. The ones that we feel are too small in the fall, we winter over. And we, they have huge den boxes that they, because they're a hibernating animal, and that they can hibernate in. And then uh, they'll come in the spring to get them. And then they go back to the region where they were found. So we, the, the four that are going to be released next month, will go back to the Catskills Region 3, and one came from our region. Yeah, we're getting bears here, folks. And so it's a little female that came, she was found south of Binghamton, which is a Region 7. And the DEC has a release site there. They do ear tag them. They give them up, they, they anesthetize them, they weigh them. They, on occasion, if the bear is going to be part of a study, they will radio collar them. And uh, then they take them back to the region and release them. Now, we raised a cub last year that was released last September. And about three days ago, I received an email from the biologist that released this cub. It was a little male, and uh, it was the ear tag number was spotted. Just, just this last week. So we know that cub made it through the winter. This is a bad winter. This is a hard winter. All of the state was a hard winter. And so anyway, 
They're not used to people at all because they were strictly hands off. Are there any recommendations for all uh, for all of us to help the natural, you know, animals out there? Whether we do something at home or yeah. would you give us some tips on what sure. we can help them? Yeah, absolutely. That's a wonderful, wonderful idea. There are some great books out there. How to garden songbird friendly. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can plant to attract hummingbirds that will attract all kinds of songbirds. And there are books that you can buy because, uh, boy, anybody that's a gardener that loves to watch songbirds, you can attract all kinds of Oreos. And um, I had at my feeder yesterday a, um, a, a rose-breasted grosby. You know, beautiful things. So you can read those and find what to plant. Um, also, you know, brush piles, just leave some brush piles. They're, they're hiding places for the animals. Mm. And I really discourage people from cutting down trees in the spring. If you got to cut down a tree, cut it down in the fall when there's not a thousand birds nests in it. And you're not interrupting the animals that need that tree as a home. I mean, I understand that trees rot, they die, and sometimes they're dangerous with highways, they have to come down, but there are certain times of year, that, you know, that are not animal friendly. So those are just some of the ideas. Uh, if you live in their country, take in your, your, your grills, they love compost, you know, a, a fed bear is a dead bear. So, you know, the people that live down in the Catskills, they have to learn to be bear conscious. But yeah, I'd like to tell a little story. Uh, we had an albino um, red tail on the farm. And he was there for two or three years, and every time we'd go to the track in the field, he would look for us. Because he knew he was going to find mice. And it went on in the winter two years ago. It was very hard. And he came to get a pigeon by the barn. I found my beautiful white hawk in a snowbird. And who did I call? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't connect until just this second. Amazing. Yeah, if you don't see them very often, but I will tell you that there is another albino red tail that lives at Raptor Trust in New Jersey, a big raptor center. Is Man, That's where he was supposed to go. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he did. Yes. Thank you. Gene, thank you very much.